So we're going to go through a story. And if you want to turn there, it's in John chapter 21, the book of John. <clears throat> so Jesus has died, <clears throat> put in the tomb, laid there for three days, rose on the third day. Then he began to appear to people. Um, he appeared to them in the uh, upper room. And so Peter has um, denied Jesus. If you remember right before Jesus died, he denied him three times. He cursed his name. And so Peter still, he's, he's seen him, but Peter's still going, I've screwed up too much. There's no way he's ever going to forgive me. Uh, yeah, I'm in the same room with him, and I'm thankful that he's here, but I'm just not worthy. And uh, so Peter says what all of us do. I'll just go back to what I know. I'll do what I know. He was a fisherman. So he went back to fishing, and Peter was a leader. And so his friends went fishing with him. They forgot what they're supposed to be out doing, and they go fishing. And uh, they go back to the old way of life. And so they're out there fishing, and they're not catching anything. And Peter's going, I believe I've been here before. <laughs> I, there's it's a little song, out all night, caught no fishes, out all night, caught no fishes. Peter, James, and John in a sailboat. And, <clears throat> and then they see somebody on the shore. And he says, try it on the other side. And then they bring in all these fish. And they bring them into the, into the uh, shore. And uh, they start counting the fish. And, and Jesus is there and he's cooking fish on the, on the shore. And then he has, <laughs> he has to come to Jesus, talk with Peter. Jesus is the one administering it though. <clears throat> so he, he talks to Peter, and that's where we are. Uh, is that the right one? Okay. They had finished when they had finished eating. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Do you? And so, what's the deed? These? Do you love me more than the people you're around? Do you love me more than your job of fishing? Do you love me more than the things of this world? So Jesus is asking him, point blank, do you love me? So that word, love there, what I'm teaching you here is there's different forms and different levels of love. This is agape. <coughs> do you dearly love me? Jesus is asking, do you really love me? Do you dearly love me? And Peter answers. Oh, sorry. So that's agapio. Do you really love me more than these? Peter answers, Yes, Lord. You know that I, phileo, love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Well, what's that word phileo? Phileo is like. Jesus says, Do you love me? And Peter says, Yep, I, I like you. Remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. Right here, he's going to get asked three times. This is, this is Jesus bringing him back. And, and Jesus saying, I know how much you love me. I'm pointing out to you how much you love me or you like me or how much you're willing to give. And so... Yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. I'm, I'm awfully fond of you. I like you, Jesus. And Jesus goes back. That's not what I was asking. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love agape? Really love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I really like you. Jesus says, take care of my sheep. The third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John. Now, 
Jesus drops it down a notch. Do you really like me? So now he's really asking Peter, you're, you're not willing to say you love me. You keep saying you like me. Now check yourself. Do you really even like me? Is that really where you are? Do you really? Peter was hurt because the third time, Jesus asked the third time, do you phileo me? Do you just like me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I like you, phileo you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus knew Peter's love was not up here. He knew Peter's love was here. And he still accepted him. He still not only accepted him, but said, here's a job I have for you. Feed my sheep. Feed the people. Not with fish, but with the truth. So, there's different places of love. There's, there's uh, this agapeo, which is to dearly love. There is agape, which is this one right here, where we ask, love is patient, love is kind. That's agape love. That's the highest love. That's God's kind of love. That's giving without expecting anything in return. That is just give, 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 give some more. I love you. No matter what happens, I love you. That's God's love. Then that um, agapeo is kind of a little bit under that. And then you have the phileo, which is I'm, I'm fond of you. And then you have Philadelphia, which is brotherly love. I, I'm there for you. Um, and then you have what the world is completely acquainted with, um, which is eros or erotic love. That's what the world is all concerned about. But there's all kinds of other parts of love. So the agape, the God kind of love, is what he's calling us to. So turn to Luke 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke. In this chapter, there's three things that God is, is pointing out uh, that get lost and, uh, and become redeemed. And uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners, sinners all drew near to hear him. The Pharisees and Sadducees grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after that one that is lost until he finds it? And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Just so I tell you, there is more joy in heaven for one sinner who repents over the ninety-nine righteous who do not need repentance. So, the important part here is verse 4. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep, and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and goes after the lost sheep until he finds it? <clears throat> I'm going to put a little into this story to help us see it. Um, let's imagine that one sheep that this is this is uh, uh, most of the way through the year and for 360 different days, 
that sheep has ran off and did his own thing and hid from the shepherd and tried to hide behind the rock so the shepherd wouldn't find him. Every time that shepherd went out and got him. All the other 99, they're all doing the right thing. They're staying where they're supposed to. But there's that one that he has to keep go getting. We always go, well, pff, just let him go. Just let him go. He's, what does Jesus tell us about forgiveness? He said 470 times in a day we should forgive. 470 times in a day that shepherd can go, okay, I've got to go get Wally the sheep. He's, he's headed out again. And uh, one more time, we'll go get him. And, uh, and what's the shepherd going to do? He's going to go, oh, stupid Wally, i got to go get him again. That's not the heart of the shepherd. He puts the sheep on his back. He doesn't go, come on, stupid sheep, get going. Get the club out and hit him. No. He picks him up and goes, I know you've had a hard day, Wally. Let's go. Let's go. Picks him up and he carries him home. And then he calls all of his friends. Hey, everybody. Wally's home. He's happy that the sheep is back. That is God's kind of love. Let's look at this. Love is patient. So Wally screwed up 360 times that year. But the shepherd is still patient. Love is kind. kind. So he didn't beat the sheep and say, you stupid sheep, get on. I'm going to shave you awful close this time. I'm going to shave you till it hurts. No. He's being kind. He's being kind. That's the love that we're supposed to have. So the next story, I'm not going to read all of it. Well, I might as well. It's short. Uh, <clears throat> verse 8. Chapter 15, verse 8. Uh, I want to explain something before I read it. She got these ten silver coins. One of them represents... She would have received these at her wedding. And now she has lost it. And so the thought is, toss it over here. It'll be all right. I'll find it later. So listen. Or what woman having ten silver coins that she got at her wedding, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, Seeking diligently until she finds it. And when she is found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before all the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That's how everybody in heaven feels. In both of these stories. Woohoo! Yes! The wife is back. Wally the sheep's back. Yes! But then there's another story. And it's called The Prodigal Son. And this is where your pastor proves how stupid he is. He has taught this. Over and over and over. And some of you have heard me preach it. And, and to me it's powerful. But raise your hand if you know what the word prodigal means. You're afraid now. <laughs> you think you do. I thought I did. What, what do you think it means? That's what you think. I thought, I, I thought that's what it did. That's what I thought it did. Oh. I thought it was, was the lost son. He's lost. He's gone out in the middle of nowhere and he's lost. I thought that rebellious. Well, nope. I, 
So we we think we have an idea of what words mean. This is why we look them up. It is negative, well, yeah. but it's not because he's it, smart. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? It's not because he's smart. But he's he's worldly. Worldly. Nope. I, I, I did not learn this until I read the book that we've been given, everybody. Oh, Cat and Dan, you have not received your books yet. We only give you one. You got to share. Um, but we're reading that book. And Corey Asbury, one of the lines is how he leaves the 99 for the one. And so he's explaining this parable. And I'm like, huh, I never looked up prodigal. Prodigal would be this. Hey, here, here's some over there. Hey, here's some over here. Hey, hey here, here you go. Here you go. There you go. He's, he's just spending crazily. Recklessly, exactly. And I'm like, oh, he's reckless with his money. So it's the reckless son who went to dear old dad, who had worked all of his life, and he goes, Dad. So he already had a reputation. Yeah, he already had that title. Right. Okay. And so he asks his dad, can I have my inheritance? Which means... Dear old dad, I wish you were dead and I had the money that you're going to give me on your deathbed. And dear old dad, who in the story represents God, this is God, we're the prodigal. How many times have you gone eh, eh, with your time, with your talent, with your treasure, you just spend it all. And... Uh, so he get God gives him the father gives him the freedom to go do whatever, and gives him the money to do it. Knowing he has a reputation for just throwing it out. And he, that's what he does. No, I, I, I'll take care of it. One place I'll clean. Um, so he he goes and blows it all on what the scripture says. Wine, women, and song. How many of us have done that? And we go and blow everything, and then he's taking a job that sucks. He's a good little Jewish boy taking care of pigs. Those don't work. And then he's going, man, I wish I had some of the pods that the pigs are eating. If you've ever seen pigs eat, you got to be really hungry to think, I wish I had what was in that trough. you got to be really hungry. And so what it says is he's, he comes to himself. He wakes up. He goes, oh, my gosh. All my father's helpers, they've got plenty of food. Life's okay for them. Why have I screwed everything up again? And he gets up and he starts heading home. So let's start at verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I think that's probably a little drama queenish. But uh, I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, father. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. So he's, he's practicing his speech. How many of us have ever practiced the speech? Here's why I screwed up. Here's what I did. I, I, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm not worthy of anything. But please... Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran to him and embraced him and kissed him. I'm going to 
finish, but then I'm going to come back to that. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I have wrongly, I am no longer to be worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put the ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet, bring the fattened calf, kill it. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have a party because my son who was dead is now alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And they began to celebrate. So start the party. The kid, the kid that he never thought he'd see again is back and he loves him. <clears throat> so let's get back to the love. The love that the father in the story has for the son, which is the father in heaven that has love for you, his prodigal child who spent their life recklessly and blown everything. When, when, when this was me, um, I was 27. Um, I got thrown out of my parents' house at 17. I had 10 years to do whatever I wanted to do. And I did everything I wanted to do. And most of them broke a commandment. And I got to that end of that 10 years of doing whatever I wanted to do. And I went, well, that was stupid. That didn't help me at all. I don't feel any better whatsoever. Actually, I feel worse. And uh, I came to myself the same way this kid in the story comes to himself and goes, I screwed up. And uh, <clears throat> so verse 20, let's look at that again. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him <coughs> and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. So the father sees the son come a long way off. He probably has not seen him for a good chunk of time. Maybe it's six months, maybe it's a year, maybe it's five years, maybe it's ten years, who knows. But just put yourself in that father's position. Your son took half of your money, disappeared, never called, never texted, never did nothing. And then you see him coming down. The flesh goes, wait until that boy gets here. I'm just going to sit over here. And I'm going to wait. And I'm going to plot and plan what I'm going to do to him when he shows up. I know, I know he's older, but he deserves a good whipping. <laughs> he needs something to set him straight. He knows not to do this. He knew not to do that, but he did it anyway. Just like the sheep. For the 360th time this year, he's ran off. But the father answers him with love. So that older Hebrew man wearing his Hebrew outfit, King James, I believe, says, girts his loins. <laughs> he pulls him up so he can get a, a good run going. Which is unheard of in that culture. The older person does not run after anything. Nope. It's, it's, it's somebody else's job to do that. I'm stately and mature. I don't run across places. So he hikes up his skirt, starts running to meet the son that squandered, recklessly spent all he had worked for all his life, or half of all he had worked for for all of his life. And when he meets him, he probably gets about 10 feet away. The smell hits him. I'm a good Jewish man, and my son smells like a pig pen. I'm not even supposed to eat pig, much as well waller around with him and feed him. And he doesn't pay any attention to that. It says that he kissed him. And when you look at the Greek words, it's, he kissed him on his neck again and again. And I've shared this, and I, it still means the same to me, so I'm going to share it with her. Some of you have heard it a hundred times. Um, 
but it's kind of more real to me since we got little Randy around. <clears throat> little kids, they get this little dirt, this little fold in their neck, and all the milk kind of gets in there. And no matter how many times you wash them, there's still stinky old milk in here. And you go to kiss them, and you can smell that nasty old milk. That's the way it was with that father. He grabs that son who he hasn't seen for an extended time and he hugs him and he kisses his neck and he smells the pig, but he doesn't care because he loves, he loves that son. He agapes that son. He doesn't, he's not just fond of him. He's not just accepting of him. He loves him dearly. He's willing to give and give and give. And that's the story that Jesus tells us, helping us to see how much the Father loves us. <clears throat> now we're going to switch gears. What does Jesus tell us is the greatest commandments? Love one another. Love God. Love your neighbor. So, we hear how much God loves us. We hear how much he accepts us. That he, even though we've screwed up over and over and over, he still greets us running, kissing our neck, loving us. So, look at yourself this week. Love. You're supposed to love God. You're supposed to love your neighbor. What has God not fulfilled to you this week that you surely thought this would have happened by now? Love is patient. <laughs> God, heck come you haven't done this yet. Why won't you do this? Love is patient. I'm getting really mad down here, God. You haven't given me... Be kind. <clears throat> what about to everybody else? Has... What has gone on in your week? Holy Spirit, you do your job. Convict us of our sin. Where have we been ungodly? Being impatient with people. Where with family members, with not so close family members, with co-workers, with our children, with people we meet at Walmart. Where have we been unloving, impatient? How are we sharing the love of God? And we think we are. And everybody else is going, really? If that person's a Christian, I don't think I want any of it. And uh, we go deep into, the, into Paul's books. You are God's ambassador. You know what an ambassador does? They go to another country and they deal with this other country where they live, what they do, how they react to people, and they're that person for the United States. They go to this other country and they try and keep the peace. You're an ambassador for Jesus, for the kingdom of God. And when people look at your life, and they look at your decisions. And they look at the things where you <clears throat> recklessly spend your life. Are they going, yeah, I want to be a part. I want to be a part. And if you're what Paul tells us, we want to live in a place where we don't convict ourselves. We're living at peace with one another. We're living at a place where you can go, yeah, I'm not perfect, but I did it this week. I did, I did this right. I, I was kind to this person. I was loving to this person. This person didn't deserve nothing, but I was kind to them. Great. That's what we're shooting for. Um, if you haven't, God's going to whip you until you're sore. No. He's greeting you again. 
His mercies are new every morning. Okay, little Wally sheep, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a come to Jesus talk. Wally, I'm letting you go. Please come back tonight. <laughs> Don't make me come look for you. I love you, little Wally. <laughs> go. Go out into the little sheep world and do your sheepy things. And he loves them anyway. So that's how the Father feels about you. You're in a covenant relationship with God once you believe, baptized in that relationship with God. It's just like this. So if you're like the woman who lost part of it, you go searching. You go searching for that part of you that is, has not been right, and, and you turn it around. If you've been that son who has blown everything, you come to your senses, you come to yourself, and head back. And, and when you screw up tomorrow, he still loves you. So... <clears throat> Shifting gears one more time. This is, I guess this is where it gets real. The same thing here. Between all of us. If we can't be loving and kind in this situation, where can we? And so when someone in the body does you wrong, treat them like Jesus would. When they have not met your expectations, well, I would have thought, insert whatever your desire is from the church family. When they don't meet that, Show them love. And, uh, and that's how we get stronger. None of us, none of us, none of us can do it on our own. That's the reason the church is here. is because on our own, we're not as strong as we are together. <clears throat> and, uh, and that's what it takes. It's so what it takes for us to live the life we're supposed to. And, uh, and no matter how that is, I, I, I know the Lord is speaking. And what we can do is, is we can say amen and then we go out the door and we go, huh, I forgot all about whatever any of that was. But uh, the Holy Spirit is working his job. He's convicting us. There's a place that you know you're accepted and you're loved, even if you screw up. But then there's the part that says, he's in here willing to help me change. Um, am I willing, just like he asked Peter, finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly, with a love, a deep, caring love, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I like you. And Jesus said, feed my land. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me with a deep love? Yes, Lord, you know I really like you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. We can say 
It's very easy, and that goes throughout the Bible. It's easy to say, I love you, Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm whatever. And that's all it is. And Jesus knows where you are, and probably the people around you know where you are. But Peter didn't know where he was. He thought, oh, I'm sold out for Jesus. I'm willing to do anything. They could take me to death today. And then he curses God three times. So take that. Where am I at? Am I walking the road I'm supposed to walk? If not, come to our senses. <clears throat> but know that he loves us and he's patient. And if he has to wait for this 361st day for, for Wally to do it right, he'll still love him. And, uh, and no, that's the relationship you have. Uh, he, Jesus is with you until you say, I don't want any more of you. I'm tired of this. That's, that's the unpardonable sins. Saying, Holy Spirit, get away. So know that no matter what you did yesterday, you're still in that relationship and he still loves you. And uh, whether it's been like with, with me, 10 years out in the world doing whatever I wanted, God loved me. So, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us with an inhuman kind of love. A love that... Uh, sees past all of our problems, all the things that we do, and you love us anyway. You love us the way a lot of parents love their kids. They, uh, the kids don't follow, but, but you, you love them anyway. And so, Lord, help us to, to see that, to know that we're blessed, chosen, accepted, adopted, forgiven, redeemed, that you love us, that you will flow through us and give us love, joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control, that you will live this kind of love. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, keeps no records wrong, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Jesus, your love never fails. You meet us right where we are, even if we don't know where we are. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would continue in this church, that you would make us within this body strong, that you would help us to connect with each other and and be able to be there for each other, even on the 360th day, the 469th time of forgiving that you're with us. And so, Lord, just draw us together and help us to live as you desire. In Jesus' name. Any questions before we're done?